Hey guys, I'm your host, Tara A. Devlin, and welcome to this week's episode of Koobana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. My latest book, Mei Taisho, Bizarre Incidents from Japan's Past, is now out. If hearing about some of the weird, bizarre, strange, and downright frightening events from the last 100 or so years of Japanese history interests you, then do head over and check it out right now. We also have a brand new design up in the Koobana merchandise store. You can find that at koobana.store. We have shirts, mugs, stickers, masks, and much more, so do check it out and help support the show at the same time. It's almost Christmas, so this week we have a selection of strange, weird, horrifying, and even a little heartwarming Christmas tales from Japan. First up, a man is hired to work security at a supermarket over the Christmas period, and while there, he runs into a rather strange woman who is perhaps hiding a deadly secret. Find out what in Homeless Woman. When I was a university student, I worked part-time as a security guard, and one winter night I was patrolling a supermarket. I'd never worked patrol before, but when I got there and spoke to the owner, he said the supermarket was open 24 hours, so at night, the nearby homeless people would often come in to get warm. And so, he wanted me to remove these people from the premises so that they wouldn't ruin the store's image. The job was for five days, starting December 21st and ending December 25th. On the very first day, I chased out quite a few people. They were all hard of hearing and had trouble walking, so it was hard to drive them out of the warmth, but that was the job. And finally, I had to deal with a 50-year-old woman who was apparently rather well known, and the store owner had even told me to do something about her in particular. This woman was a pest who would wear the clothes she stole from the store, eat the food, wear the makeup, put on the perfume, etc, etc. They had called the police on her numerous times, but because she was never caught on camera and only one or two people testified against her, they claimed that they couldn't do anything. I approached the old woman to talk to her, but as soon as she saw me, she ran off. In the end, my first day ended by playing tag without running with the old woman. On the second day, the old woman seemed to have decided I wasn't that scary, and rather than running away when I approached her, she cursed at me instead. You sure are seedy looking for a security guard. Look at you, plucking your eyebrows. What are you, a girl? She said when she saw me. Everyone knows how much of a coward you are. She then continued with a string of abuse that didn't make much sense. I was afraid that if I provoked her, then things would get worse, so I just laughed and nodded along with her. Once I was done listening to her tirade, I told her that if she wasn't buying anything, then the owner would like her to leave. She took out her purse and showed it to me, then started a tirade of abuse again. She was surprisingly quick-witted and... Unable to do anything else, I listened to her bad-mouthing with a smile. On the third day, the old woman approached me and started abusing me again, but then it seemed she got bored of that and started asking me various questions instead. She asked me about my age, my education, why I was a security guard, my income and so on, and I answered everything with lies. After a while, I turned the questions back on her. Do you have any family? I asked. Who said you could ask me any questions? The woman went off again, but then she started talking about her family. In short, her daughter was attacked several years prior and her husband blamed her for going somewhere where that could have happened. After that, the old woman developed an intense dislike for men and started living alone with her now divorced daughter. I told her I was terribly sorry to hear that, but I didn't believe her story at all. If she was living with her daughter, then she wouldn't be homeless, and there was no way she'd tell a stranger like me a story like that if it had actually happened. In the end, I was unable to get rid of her. On the fourth day, after kicking everyone except the old woman out, 
I did my patrol while ignoring her. There were two reasons for that. First was to prevent people from claiming that all I did was talk to the homeless people. If my company received such a report, then I'd no doubt receive a written notice. The other reason goes without saying. It was Christmas Eve. It just wasn't the appropriate time to be talking with her. On the final day, I chased everyone out as usual and then continued my patrol. I'd given up on getting rid of the old woman, but at the very least, I wanted to make sure she didn't steal anything. As I walked around the store, muttering to myself about what a crappy, boring year it had been, someone tapped me on the shoulder from behind. When I turned around, that old woman was standing there, with a smile on her face. Surprised, I bowed and went to leave, but she grabbed my arm and then handed me a notebook. That's my daughter, she said with a smile. I was already done with her nonsense, but I smiled and opened the book. It was a small photo album. There was one photo per page, starting with a baby girl and, with each new page, she got older and older. She was a beautiful girl with big eyes and pale skin, but her face looked just like the old woman's, so she no doubt really was her daughter. She's very pretty, I said as I flicked through the album, and about halfway through, there were several photos of the woman's sleeping face. After three or so more photos, I realised the daughter was sick. Her complexion wasn't that bad, but... Her cheeks gradually got more hollow, and her eyes sunken. Judging by the pictures, I was starting to think the old woman was homeless because all her money had been spent on her daughter in the hospital. From the bottom of my heart, I honestly felt bad for her. However, as I flipped through the pages, my brow furrowed, and a strange feeling grew inside me. Her sleeping face continued for another seven photos. Then, my hand stopped on the eighth. The previous photos didn't show her neck, but in the corner of this one, I could see it. There was a dark bruise on it. It was purple and cut across her neck in a long line. I couldn't turn the page anymore. I looked at the old woman, my hands trembling, but she just smiled gently at me and looked at the album. She looked entirely different to the woman who had been abusing me for the last few days. I pushed the album back into her hands and then told her I had forgotten something important before rushing back to the office. I told the manager what had just happened and then called the police, but the old woman was gone by the time they arrived. Shortly thereafter, I quit my job. The whole time I was talking to that old woman, I was wearing a name tag with my company name and real name on it. Several years have passed since then, but the police still haven't contacted me about what happened. And the fact they haven't no doubt means that they haven't built a case against the old woman. At the time, I was so consumed with fear that I couldn't think straight, but looking back on it now, I'm starting to think that maybe the old woman created that album as a fake just to scare me. At the very least, I hope that's what happened. The student in this next story enjoys watching a video at his cram school every Christmas, but during this particular year, they see something they really shouldn't have. Find out what in Special Christmas Plan. This happened when I was in elementary school. I went to a nearby mathematics school, and I looked forward to going there on Christmas Day every single year. The reason for that was because on Christmas Day, and Christmas Day alone, we wouldn't have classes. Instead, the teacher would show us an 8mm film. These films were mostly anime, such as Gambare Tabuchi-kun, Disney movies, Chaplin films, and more. Then, when they were finished, the teacher would hand out candy. It was great fun every year. However, when I was in the sixth grade, for some reason, that year seemed different. There were around 13 students in the small classroom, 
only about 10 tatami mats large. The teacher put the film on the projector, turned the lights off, and then the film began. The projector clanked as it started. The homemade screen lit up. But no matter how long we waited, Gambare Tabuchikun didn't start. Huh, that's odd. Please wait a moment, the teacher said, then left the classroom to get some tools. After rolling for a bit, the white screen suddenly changed to show something else. It was a girl. She was around the same age as us, and she was running happily around a park. But we knew this girl well. Yes, she was the teacher's daughter. The teacher must have filmed her on 8mm as that was their hobby. But suddenly, I grew scared. That girl had died of illness almost one year earlier. Normally, us students were always noisy as hell, but nobody said a thing, and we all just turned our eyes away from the screen. I think three or so minutes passed, and then finally the film ended and the projector stopped. The light from the lens went out, and the classroom went dark. One of the students up the front, perhaps unable to stand the darkness any longer, stood up. Where's the light switch? He said, and started searching for it. When he turned around, he pointed behind us, and then screamed before fleeing the room. As if a dam had burst, everyone silently ran out of the room after him. Even now, I'm still telling myself that it was just a moment of mass hysteria, but what still doesn't add up is that the last student to leave the room, a good friend of mine, said that the teacher forcibly grabbed his arm at the exit and said to him, Don't you dare run away. Thanks to that, I stopped going to that school, but it's still in business today. A man finds an unexpected, anonymous present in his mailbox. But what's the truth behind the sender? Find out in Christmas Present. Almost ten years ago, on Christmas Eve, I found a present for me in our apartment's collective mailbox. It was beautifully wrapped, with a cute ribbon attached, but I had no idea who it was from. Maybe someone had a thing for me, I thought, and excited, I opened the wrapping. Inside was a beautiful blue scarf with a pink envelope. I opened the envelope first, figuring that if I read the letter, I could figure out who it was from. It was written on cute stationery with cute lettering that seemed to dance out at me. It was a rather long letter, but to sum it up, it went a little something like this. We have never spoken directly, but I've always liked you. I put all my feelings into this handmade scarf for you. I would be most pleased if you used it. So, first of all, the letter wasn't addressed to me. It appeared to be for someone else, but they had written the wrong address or something on it. Disappointed, I wondered what to do with the scarf. After thinking it over for a while, I decided to deliver it to the nearest police box. On my way home from work the next day, I dropped the scarf off at the police box. The officer looked a little confused, but he took it as lost property. Then, when I got back to my apartment, this time, there was a plain brown unstamped envelope in the mailbox. I cut it open and inside there was a single phrase written in black marker. Give it back. Five minutes later, I hung a note on the apartment's mailbox. I delivered the scarf to the police box. I'm really sorry for opening it. The next morning, the note had been roughly torn off. A man working at a recycling shop recounts some of the strange customers and items he's seen over the years, including a rather strange Christmas incident. Find out what in... The Strange Customers and Items I work at a recycling shop, and this happened after 10pm one night during the middle of December. 
A middle-aged man clung to the door and looked inside with a creepy smile on his face. He was staring right at me. Can I help you? I asked, walking over to the door. There's something I'd like to sell, he said. I'm sorry, but the store is already closed. You'll have to come back during opening hours. But then he started screaming and banging on the door. It's your life. I'll kill you. Die! Clearly, the man wasn't well. His eyes were wide open and bloodshot, and drool trickled down over his stubble. He wore a sweater, chino pants and sneakers, and his hair was a mess. He was of medium height and weight, and probably in his 40s. In short, he wasn't someone I wanted to go near. If I called the police, then it would take a few days, and my daily work would be delayed as well. Honestly, it was just such a hassle. I couldn't just go home and leave him there, and looking at his face just made me angry, so I grabbed the heater and sat with the other staff by the entrance, smoking a cigarette and drinking some coffee as we chatted. Around 11pm, the man got bored and went away. Day 2. The same man showed up again, so the staff and I ate some steamed buns as he glared at us. He showed no signs of leaving, so I grabbed a coffee and, once again, watched him as I sipped it. Day 3. Christmas. Again, an angry or crazed voice came from the door. Another me popped up in my head and was smiling. Hey, today's Christmas! But the next moment, the man started singing Happy Birthday to You in the voice of Sergeant Hartman from Full Metal Jacket. Without saying a word, I pulled a fake sword from the pile of goods and carried it over to the entrance. The screaming man suddenly looked confused and, with his mouth gaping open and shut, he suddenly took off running. What a smile, the other staff members said. Were they talking about me? That man never appeared again. If he was Santa, well, I'm so sorry. I kind of wanted a present. Another time, a woman in her mid-thirties brought in some expensive brand jewellery and such. I wish I could sell my new husband here too, she said. Oh no, if you did, then he would be second-hand goods. Well, aren't there plenty of second-hand men who simply shine? She replied. Well, the ones who get sold to second-hand stores are the ones who have problems. Rather than finding a second-hand husband, you'd be better off finding a brand new one. Yeah, you might be right. I don't suppose you could tell me where they sell those. Well, we don't deal in the living, so I have no idea. Ah... That's too bad, the woman said with a friendly smile. A few weeks later, the woman came back to the store. This is my new husband, she said. Wasn't that a little fast? I said with a laugh. Well, of course, I had my eye on him, she said right away. I wondered what happened to her old husband, or if, perhaps, he was actually someone else's husband to begin with. Women really are scary. Then there was this item we once had. At a glance, it looked like a regular oil painting of a Western woman, but when I peeled back part of it that looked like it had been painted over, the face beneath it was clearly falling apart, like the eyeballs were hanging from the sockets and the mouth was wide open. The signature had also been painted over and when I peeled it back, it said... You are going to die. The woman who brought the painting in was a woman in her 40s, and she'd been to the store numerous times, so I remembered her well. The next time she came in, I asked her about it. So, that painting really was strange then? A little, yes. When it was hanging in our house, its gaze always scared me, so I got into a fight with my husband about it and then brought it here. 
where did you buy it? My husband got it at a flea market. It wasn't a strange painting, but the man selling it said he would give it to my husband for free if he took it, so he did. Is that so? But what was so strange about it? Show me. Ah, uh, I think it would be better if you didn't see it, I said with a smile. Oh, come on. I have to know. It's not something scary, is it? Yeah, a little. Eh? <sighs> well, can you show me anyway? I really think you shouldn't. I told her this over and over, but curiosity got the better of her and she wanted to see it regardless. I showed her the painting in the storehouse and the moment she saw it, she burst into tears and then I think she left to call her husband. Her face went bright red on the phone and she almost looked like a Hanya mask. Her body emitted this murderous aura that you could almost physically see as she shouted angrily into the phone. Honestly, that woman was more frightening than the picture she brought in. A university student out for the night at a Christmas party notices a few drunks playing around on the street outside, but as a car approaches, well, find out what happens in Man in Red. This happened during the Christmas of 1995. The performances for the club I was a part of at university were finally over, so all of us club members gathered at a nearby Izakaya pub to celebrate. Since the party started late, it was around one in the morning when things finally wrapped up. When we went outside, there were numerous drunk people hanging around, just like us. And amongst those, two people in particular were making a lot of noise and wrestling each other in the middle of the street. It was late at night and the road was off the main street, so there weren't many cars. There was a man dressed entirely in red, and he seemed to be pulling the other man over and over, like they were clinging to each other as they played. Finally, a car approached. As the men played in the middle of the road, it honked its horn as it got closer. Yet even as it did, the two men showed no signs of moving out of the way. Two of their friends watching from the side of the road noticed this and started to yell that they were in danger, but still, the two men didn't notice and continued their game. The car continued pushing forward, perhaps under the assumption that the two men would eventually understand and move aside. But it was too late. One of the men who was screaming from the side of the road jumped in front of the car and pushed the two men aside. They rolled into a ball and just barely avoided getting hit, and the car continued on its way. I almost saw something horrifying. With that on my mind, I turned to look at the men, and they were being told off. But the man in red wasn't there. What the hell were you thinking? Didn't you hear us? No, I heard you, but for some reason I couldn't move my legs. The man in red was gone. Have you ever heard the legend of the Kyofu Shimbun? or Terra newspaper, a newspaper that supposedly predicts upcoming deaths. Well, the man in this next story discovers that he might be receiving one, and it's perhaps the delivery boy himself who's about to die. Find out what happens in Real Terra Newspaper. I'm a 46-year-old man, who looks like Kamakura Fujio. I'm an assistant manager at a sweets factory who enjoys going for drives. My type would be Hasegawa Kyoko, but my wife looks like Amachi Muddy. At any rate, putting that aside, this is a strange, supernatural experience I once had. For whatever reason, I have to be at work by 5am, so I wake up at 4. The first thing I do is light a cigarette, but because I can't smoke in the house, I do so outside. As I'm smoking, I often see the boy who delivers our papers. One morning as I looked at him, I realised he looked really young. Are you a junior high student? I asked. No, 
I'm in high school. Good morning, he replied with a refreshing greeting first thing. Just between us, I used to deliver newspapers as well when I was in high school. I was paid 25,000 yen. These days, it's around 40,000, I think. And from that, 7,000 went to my school fees, 5,000 for bills, and the rest was pocket money for me. And so, I felt a bit of an affinity for this kid. Due to the nature of my job, I was able to bring a lot of sweets home, and so I often gave him some. He'd always reply loudly with a big, Thank you! So anyway, one Christmas I was out in the garden having a cigarette when the high school boy arrived to deliver our paper. But for some reason, he was acting different to usual. He didn't even say hello and just roughly shoved the newspaper towards me. Before it was even in my hands, he left. What the hell was that about? And here I am always giving him candy, I thought, annoyed. But then I realised something. Ah, it's Christmas, so maybe his girlfriend rejected him or something. Yeah, it had to be something like that, I convinced myself. I went inside and started reading the newspaper. The front page headline said, High school students slaughtered. Huh, I thought, quickly scanning over the headlines, but it was the usual stuff I saw on TV, sports news condolences, etc., so I put it down and started getting ready for work. As I left through the front gate to go to work, a strange, overweight old man held out a newspaper and said, Good morning. Who are you? I asked. I'm only subscribed to this paper. Uh, yes, this is that paper, he said. But I already received it today. Eh? But the delivery boy is absent today, so there's no way. Huh? At any rate, I took the newspaper he was offering. It really was the one I was subscribed to. The paper was folded, but I could see the front headline. It was talking about politics. It was different to the other one. Come to think of it, high school students slaughtered wouldn't exactly be an appropriate headline, would it? Worried, I went back inside to check the newspaper on the kitchen table, but it was gone. My wife was awake, so I asked her about it, but she said she never saw any newspaper. Huh? I thought, but I was going to be late, so I rushed out the door. I was so busy at work that I forgot about the morning's events. Then, the next day, as I went outside to smoke, the high school boy arrived. Again, he tossed the paper at me without saying a word. Hey, I screamed. You keep acting like that and I won't give you treats anymore. But the boy just left. Little shit, I thought. But when I looked at the paper, again, I saw the headline. High school student slaughtered. What? I skipped over the article the day before, but this time I decided to read it. The body of a high school student on his way to deliver newspapers was discovered today. Roughly a week has passed since his death. He was covered in 16 stab wounds all over his body. There was damage to the pinky finger on his right hand and the middle finger on his left. His skin was removed. There were numerous subcutaneous hemorrhages. The direct cause of death was numerous blows to the head. Two-thirds of the brain were lost. Facial recognition was impossible, and so dental records were used to identify the remains. The body was discovered by a forest path in XX City. What? That city was where I lived. And there was a forest path not too far from my house. Come to think of it, usually he turned the corner after leaving our house, but the last two times, he went straight. If you kept going straight, roughly two kilometres away, was a forest path. No way. As I was getting ready to leave, I saw the same overweight man from the day before trying to put a newspaper in our letterbox. Is he also absent today? I asked. Yes. Then he continued as though talking to himself. 
There's been no contact. He hasn't returned home either. Considering the previous newspaper I'd just read, I made a joke. Maybe he's dead. The man just laughed weakly. The next day, he came again. Again, he wordlessly tossed the paper at me. Aren't you dead? I suddenly asked the boy. But he ignored me and continued straight towards the forest path. Again, the headline said, High school students slaughtered. The article was the same as the day before, too. Could it be that he really was dead and wanted me to find him? I decided to call in sick and go look for him, despite the fact the end of the year was one of the busiest times for us. I called work, briefly went back to sleep, and then, around lunchtime, I set out. I looked all over, including the bushes on the side of the path, but in the end, I didn't find anything. The next day I overslept, so I quickly got changed and, without even washing my face, I stepped outside to go to work when I ran into the overweight man again. He was dead, he said. Inside an oil drum behind his own house. Apparently, he froze. The coroner said he died on Christmas Eve. But how did you know he was dead? Are you some kind of prophet or something? But I was already late for work, so I didn't have time to talk. I went straight to work. And that was my supernatural experience. Why did such a thing happen to me? Is this sort of thing normal in a world run rampant with people and money? As a final addendum, I discovered that student lived not too far from my house, so I decided to take some sweets over and threw them into his backyard. Of course, not as an act of meanness, but as a way to pay respects to him. A convenience store worker who has an awful boss finally quits his job around Christmas time, but it may not be the last he hears of him. But what's really going on? Find out in Forced Unpaid Work. This happened around three years ago. I was working part-time at a convenience store, and it was one of those jobs where they sometimes forced you to do unpaid overtime. I started work there in autumn, but because three people quit one after the other and had to be replaced, I was working with less staff than I was supposed to. Even though we were rather busy, the boss was a man who liked to abuse his power like it was perfectly normal. He would scream at us out the back and he had no problem grabbing us by the shirt to threaten us either. By the end of the year, there were still no new employees and the boss's abuse got worse. He was now yelling at us even when there were customers right there in the store. Looking back on it now, I think he was in a real bad place mentally. So, as Christmas approached, it was time for us to sell Christmas cakes. He told me that I would have to buy any cakes that didn't sell, and realising that I was about to reach my mental limit as well, I got the hell out of there. I just had nothing left in me. I changed phones on the way home and got a brand new number too. At first, I was worried that he might come to my house and beat me up, but Christmas and then New Year's passed, and nothing happened. On New Year's morning the following year, I got a call from an unknown number and, being half asleep, I accidentally answered it. It was from the boss. Don't think you can escape that easily, he said in an angry voice, and I was so frightened that I immediately hung up. I thought about going to the police, just in case, but unexpectedly, nothing happened after that. A few weeks later, I just happened to run into a former colleague from that job. I thought things might be awkward, so I tried to pretend I didn't see him, but he then approached me. Then he said something I really didn't expect. Apparently, on the day I left work, the boss jumped in front of a train. He died. 
maybe he really had lost his mind, because apparently the day before he did it, he was constantly tweeting my name as well. Of course, that store closed soon thereafter, and my colleague moved to a different store to work. He wasn't shocked at all, though. On the contrary, he was relieved. But then, if that was so, who on earth called me on New Year's morning? I know there's a famous story of a power-tripping boss who put a curse on people to kill them in their dreams, but thinking that such a thing might happen to me as well is honestly terrifying. And finally, a young boy recounts a tale his mother told him that happened to the two of them when he was just a small child. A gentle reminder to be thankful during the holiday season. Find out why in Gratitude to the Kami Summer. I heard this story from my mother when we were drinking tea after dinner one night. It happened close to 20 years ago, so I don't remember it, but it involved both my mother and I. I was in the first grade of elementary school at the time, and I lived in Nagano with my mother, my baby sister, and my grandparents. Now I live in Kyoto by myself. Anyway, let me tell you about what happened then. Our mother was a single working mother, and as you might expect, she worked from morning till night. She was in her late 20s at the time, and during the day, she worked at a coffee shop, and at night, she worked as a delivery driver for her uncle's butcher shop in her own car. We lived in an area where you needed a car to function, and there were a lot of elderly people, so being able to have meat delivered with a single phone call was a blessing that people appreciate even to this day. My mother was a good driver as well, so she really enjoyed her job. My mother was a picture of innocence at the time, always smiling, and because she was still young, her aunt and uncle from the butcher shop, other relatives and even the customers, treated her like she was their own granddaughter. She often came home with sweets for me and my sister that they always gave her. Even when I return home now, I think about what a lovely community it is. Anyway, that was how things were at the time. This happened late one Christmas night, when my mother was delivering some meat from the butcher shop. She would be home late, so I was asleep at home with my sister and grandparents in the same room. On the nights our mother was home, the three of us would sleep in a room on the second floor. Suddenly, when my grandfather woke up, I was gone. He thought maybe I had gone to the toilet, but when he went to check, I wasn't there either. That's odd he thought, and then checked the kitchen and the living room as well, but he couldn't find me anywhere. He went to wake my grandmother up so they could look for me together, and thinking that maybe I went outside, they rushed to the front door and realised my shoes weren't there. By that point, the date had already changed, and it was three in the morning on December 26th. Their faces went pale and Grabbing their coats, they rushed out the door and saw a child's footprints still remained. They followed the footprints towards the mountains and found me walking on an icy slope nearby. Forgetting that it was so late at night, they screamed and ran for me. I'm going to see mum, I said in my shoes and pyjamas, and I was holding my mother's jumper in hand. My grandmother was confused, but... Then she realised that my mother actually wasn't home yet. Apparently, I had a dream where my mother had an accident and she was freezing cold on the road somewhere. Panicking, my grandparents tried to call my mother, but she didn't answer. They called her uncle at the butcher shop to check on her, but the gasoline money she was supposed to bring back, as well as the keys to lock up, were still there. Fearing the worst, they called the police, explained the situation and asked them to send out a search party. An hour later, they found my mother unmoving on a mountain road. Her car had slipped on the ice and she had an accident. She was out of gas, her phone battery had died, and so she had no way to contact anyone. If we had waited until morning, then things would have no doubt been much, much worse. 
Honestly, I don't remember much of what happened up until that point, but when we went to pick my mother up from the hospital, she cried as she held me. Thank the Kamisama, she repeated over and over. That part, I still remember even now. According to my mother, there were a lot of deliveries that night, although not quite as many as Christmas Eve, and it happened after she finished the final delivery for the night, and there was only about one hour of Christmas left. After delivering a large quantity of shabu shabu meat to the next town over, all she had to do was return to the butcher and then go home. She didn't have a lot of gas left after so many deliveries, but she planned to pick up the money and the key back at the store and then fill up on the way home. Plus, she was feeling rather down about not being able to spend Christmas with her children as she drove back. She was used to the roads, but quite a bit of snow had fallen over the previous few days, and the mountain roads were full of slopes and curves. Although the tyres were studless, she drove as safely as she could, but suddenly, something black appeared on the road. Maybe a boar or cerro. And thinking she would hit it, she slammed on the brakes and sent the car into a spin. It then slid down the road and plunged face first into the side of a cliff, coming to a complete stop. Luckily, she wasn't injured too badly, but she figured she should call the support center and her family first. But when she looked at her phone, the battery was dead from running all day. When she saw that, she said, her blood ran cold. Even though we lived in the central part of Japan, it wasn't that odd for temperatures to drop below zero at night in Nagano during winter. Plus, she chose that specific road knowing that it would be empty, and not many cars used it. It was the middle of the night, her phone was dead, and she had no gas. If you've ever grown up in snow country, then you no doubt understand the anxiety she was feeling. Anyway, she had to get someone's attention, so she kept honking the car horn, but there was no response. But what else could she do? She kept pressing it. She knew she was far from civilization and, at that point, started crying. Home was so, so far away, and all she had said was, I'll be home late. Her aunt and uncle from the butcher shop had already gone home, and it was her job to close the store, so they wouldn't even realize that she wasn't back yet. And us children and our grandparents would be asleep, so we wouldn't notice anything strange either. In the middle of a snowy night in Nagano's winter, with no gas and no food, there was no way my mother would be able to survive in the car. And as that was on her mind, the gas finally ran out, and the car started to get colder. She honked the horn over and over, but nobody came. She gathered up as much cloth as she could wrap herself in, but it was so cold, and with her phone dead, the only thing she could see was her breath getting whiter and whiter. She started to cry, thinking she would die thinking that she just wanted to see her children one more time. She put her hands together in apology and prayed to the Kamisama from the Suwataisha shrine that she always visited first thing every New Year's. And then, before long, a police car pulled up and called out her name. Your family is looking for you, they said, and she started crying again in relief as she got in the police car. For my mother... It really was a frightening experience. We all laughed as we drank tea, thinking it was very like my mother to thank the Japanese Kamisama on Christmas night, and I thought it would be an interesting story to share here too. I'm very grateful to the Kamisama as well. A massive thank you and shout out to this week's Kamitia members, Christina and S Dash. It's thanks to your support along with everyone else, that I'm able to keep doing this show, so thank you very much. Don't forget to check out Mei Taisho, Bizarre Incidents from Japan's Past, out on Amazon right now. And check out our newly revamped merchandise store at kowabana.store. And if you'd like to chat about this week's stories, come and join us in the Kowabana Discord. You can find that link in the description or on kowabana.net. You can also check out our Patreon, 
at patreon.com slash Tara A. Devlin for exclusive bonus stories and extras, or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Kawabana Japan for all sorts of Japanese horror you won't find anywhere else. Thanks, guys. Stay safe, and I'll see you again next time for even more Kawabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Want even more scary stories? Head over to koabana.net for new translations every week. You can also join our Patreon for exclusive stories you won't find anywhere else. Head over to koabana.net now.